Okay, so this week we'll go through uh, memory, and I'll focus quite a bit on amnesia. So obviously this is a famous movie depiction of somebody who lost their memory. But uh, although they lose their memory and would perhaps beat the classification of being amnesic, they still, for instance, know, they've remembered how to walk, remembered how to talk. He can still speak, I think, several lam languages in the film. So the question is, what do you actually remember um, after... Uh, becoming amnesic. And what does this tell us about memory? It suggests that memory is more than one thing. And we kind of already know that a little bit when we talk about semantic memory, which is quite different from this uh, kind of memory. But how does this all work in the brain? How does it all come together? So this is a real-world example of somebody with amnesia called Clive Waring, who's been described as uh, the most severely amnesic person kind of on record. Uh, and I'll show you a little bit of what his life is like. One man is consigned to live entirely within the present with terrible consequences. Clive Waring has the worst case of amnesia ever known. Twenty years ago, he lost his memory, and now his wife, Deborah, is the only person he recognizes. really only has less than 30 seconds memory and sometimes it's as little as perhaps seven seconds it's as little as a sentence I'm going to see your sister Adele her daughter's got married recently uh, oh, in New Zealand uh -huh. and so they're having a party funny how the ladies acquire a different title when they get married do you know who I'm going to see tomorrow uh, looking pose no really guess I do don't you, know. you don't know mm. Adele Oh, is it? Do, you know, do you know why I'm going? No. She's having a party at her house tomorrow. It's her birthday, isn't it? No. Yeah. Do you know why? No. It's to do with her daughter. No, yeah, she... Do you no. know why her daughter's having a party? No. Guess. No, I don't. She's just got married. Oh, I see. She's just got married in... Do you know what country she just got married in? No, yeah. In New Zealand. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. The sentence he is in, he will probably have forgotten the sentence before. You ask him a question uh, and he'll give you an answer, but while he's giving you the answer, he's already forgotten the question. That's how short it is. I'm going to see your kids tomorrow. I'm going to see my kids? Yeah, your children. What are they up to now? Do you know what they're up to no, now? No, no. Guess what you think they're up to? No, I couldn't guess. I know what their own levels were. They hadn't got their own level last time I was conscious. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know what possible thing they do, did I? Yeah. No, I couldn't possibly guess. What? Where do you think they are? Well, I don't know. I don't know where I am. Yeah. All he has well. is void behind him. Must well, be been like death. I've never seen a human being before. Never had a dream or a thought. The brain has been totally inactive. Day and night the same. No thoughts at all. And as far as I'm concerned, the doctors have been totally incompetent. I've never seen a doctor. The whole time. <laughs> oh, look, it's comfortable. Oh, 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 So yeah, there's lots of kind of interesting bits there, but it's actually quite hard to make sense of um, some of it. But, but if we think about what he can do, I mean, his language is pretty good. Uh, I mean, he, you know, he's got this very kind of fancy accent. He's talking about how it's funny that when women get married, they change their names and that, this sort of thing. So he's coming out with this sort of stuff. You saw him at the beginning playing a very complex piece on the piano. Uh, so this is something that he um, hadn't forgotten. He obviously could remember and recognise his wife, because whenever she leaves the room and comes back, it's like he hasn't seen her uh, for a year. So he knows who she is. He knows who his children are, although he knows them from when they were doing what he called his own level, so the, the kind of equivalent uh, of GCSEs, but he's not kind of updated those. It's not that he's amnesic uh, for his children. Um, any other things that kind of surprised you or interested you? Yeah. 
Hmm. Is this the same when he's talking? When so he's talking himself? Oh, I, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I don't know if you would test that. I guess, provided that, that his kind of goal is active and he can man, maintain that goal long enough in mind, that then he probably would. So uh, with other people with kind of digit span and so on, is that often they can hold it in mind for 10, 15 minutes, but all they're doing is just doing, you know, going over it. And as soon as it's they're doing something else, it's gone. So it's not strictly the amount of time itself. So that was a bit of an inaccuracy. It's more to do with keeping it in mind. But as soon as you've it's gone out of your mind, it's like it's gone forever, almost, you know. When his wife's not there, does he remember that he has a wife? Well, yeah, I, I suspect he would. I suspect he would, because that was kind of the example of the kids, wasn't it, where he said that. What was also surprising... Yeah, what were you going to say? Oh, I was just going to ask you if any deficits at all in his procedural Um... I don't know with him. Procedural memories, things like the piano playing and so on. My guess is that... Typically, they, they, they don't have them. Uh, obviously, you can use one memory system to compensate for another and so on, so he wouldn't be able to do that. What was interesting is that he had some uh, kind of insight into this. So um, why, you know, all this business of not seeing doctors. Obviously, he had seen doctors, but why did he think he needed to see one? So that was a bit of a puzzle. And actually, when he was told that his children were kind of grown up and they weren't at school, you know, if somebody would say that to me, you know, that... that you know, you would have some element of kind of shock or something that I've lost 20, 30 years. And there wasn't that kind of surprise. So, again, this is kind of interesting that you might have some kind of emotional awareness that actually things aren't right for you, uh, but you're not putting them in words. And that, that's uh, something that come up. So I'll, I'll cover all of these things in the lecture, but that, that's just one example. This is kind of the, if you like, the, the classic textbook example of HM here, who was really the first um, case study. So HM's, you know, certainly more uh, famous in this because he's been studied so much. And basically, HM had uh, epilepsy uh, as a child, and a lot of epilepsy originates from the temporal lobes, so the decision was made by the surgeon to remove uh, parts of the what's called the medial temporal lobes, which includes the hippocampus, which... Uh, fortunately uh, cured his epilepsy, but left him amnesic. Now this, you might imagine, why would the surgeons do that to somebody, aside from the honourable kind of thing of curing the epilepsy? But literally before the 1950s, people did not know that the hippocampus was to do with memory. They thought it was to do with kind of emotions and things like this. And this was partly because people with uh, epileptic seizures around the hippocampus would kind of have... Uh, I suppose dreamlike kind of states and, and, and so on, but they, they, somebody with epilepsy around the hippocampus didn't appear to be amnesic, but you have to actually remove it in order to see that. So uh, obviously it's not something that would be done as, uh, you know, as much subsequently for that reason. Um, there would have to be a very strong case for it. But basically he never uh, kind of regained his memory, so several decades after the operation, he can't remember what his last meal was, where he lives, or his own present age. So if you ask him how old he was, he could be off by as much as 43 years. So again, going back to the past and maybe the time in which he'd done that. But clearly, at some level, he's not lacking memory. He could still remember how to speak, speak and learn. So, so what is it that he has and what is it that he doesn't have? And really, the, the puzzle here for thinking about memory is that, you know, if we... Um, think about a kind of modern day phrenologist's head. Are we really going to draw a module on the brain and label it as memory? And I think the answer is clearly not. But if not, then why is it that you can get this kind of symptom? And the reason why you wouldn't kind of want to, you know, label something very simplicity as memory is that the whole brain is capable of learning and remembering. And that's just the phenomenon of plasticity. Basically, that as you're listening to me now, I am changing the structure in your brain. I'm causing uh, neurons to wire together by firing together, by being in this room, by listening to what I'm saying, by this context. Your brains are changing structurally now, and it isn't just happening in one module, it's happening in multiple places throughout your brain. So your whole brain is capable of plasticity. Um, so the, the question here is, what is that particular function that, that is down in amnesia? Because um, uh, it, it clearly can't be the whole brain that, that's dysfunctional. 
And I think the idea here is that the whole brain is capable of learning and memory, but for different kinds uh, of material. So in a way, our kind of high-level visual cortex is dealing with memory. So a memory of what happens when one surface is in front of another, how you group lines and edges together. In a way, that's something that is memory. It's something that you learn. It's something that infants get from their experiences of the world. So that's memory, but it's not the kind of memory we're talking about here. Uh, words and things like this. This is also memory. Uh, so somebody from another country will not have our set of words because they've not been through the same learning experiences as you. <clears throat> so the way in which we kind of think about this is in terms of memory systems. And this is quite a helpful way of thinking about it, but there's been a lot of resistance to this because people think actually all these systems interact, there are sharp boundaries between them, and that is true, but I'm still going to present it this way because it is uh, a useful way of thinking about it, but I will delve into some of the subtleties as to why it's not uh, simple. So the first major division we have is between short-term memory and long-term memory. Short-term memory is kind of what we see in that video of just what is held currently in mind. So your current sentence, your current set of sentences, uh, or, or whatever. Or whatever is in your kind of visual imagination, your visual view. That is your kind of uh, short-term memory. A long-term memory is really everything else. So even something like remembering what I had for lunch or remembering what I had for breakfast that happened today is technically in my long-term memory, okay? Unless I've been thinking about my lunch since I had it and it's never left my mind, which would be odd. Um, and within long-term memory, the, the two that, that I'll kind of... Uh, the other division here is between what's called explicit memory and uh, kind of implicit memory. So implicit memory are things like skills, so riding a bike, playing the piano. Uh, here, these are kind of classical conditioning here. So for instance, um, that you see a, a flash of light and it triggers an electric shock. There's kind of Pavlovian things as well. These, these are things that are relatively kind of unconscious learning. Unconscious things are our episodic memory and our semantic memory here. So this is memories of things that are particular instances. So an episode would be like a collection of being in this room, in this situation, uh, and, and so on. But this is kind of like an episode. So we can see that amnesia is affecting this more than the others, but we'll look at the evidence of that. So short-term memory is uh, currently held in mind. It's defined as having limited capacity. So the idea here is that there's only so much you can hold in mind, whether it's one sentence, one set of words, or X number of objects in your visual field. Whereas the idea is that long-term memory has, in theory, an uncountable memory. Obviously, you could say unlimited. There are limits posed by the number of kind of connections in your brain and so on. Uh, but, but essentially, it's not something you can count would be the way of describing it. Uh, and this is kind of a stored information that, that might not be uh, accessible. Okay. So an early model of short-term memory, in effect, kind of imagine that you go from perception to putting something in short-term memory and then long-term. So perception here could be of speech, it could be of vision or whatever. And the idea is that there was a short-term store that held all of this stuff into mind and that this was needed in order to, to kind of learn things. <laughs> This model effectively fell out of favour in, in, uh, because it seemed clear that this short-term store wasn't one thing. It seemed to be at least two, if not more things. And what that means is that if you hold in mind a sentence, for in instance, um, you can still hold in mind visual information. So you've got almost a capacity for, uh, for words and a capacity for vision. Whereas you can't hold necessarily multiple sentences in, in mind. They will start to interfere and drop out uh, of this. So it seems as if there are two, at least two sets of capacity, one for visuospatial things and one for uh, more verbal things and perhaps other divisions as well. It also became clear that, uh, that actually that these short-term stores weren't necessarily uh, essential for, for long-term learning. So there were some patients, for example, almost the opposite of amnesia, who had digit spans of, say, one, who were then capable of learning complex episodes. So here it seemed as if you could learn things without going through that store. So essentially what was developed beyond this was the idea that short-term memory itself could be fractionated into multiple things, 
One we would call phonological short-term memory, which is kind of verbal short-term memory, which is visuospatial. And basically, these would lie kind of more in your parietal lobes, and we can think of them also as being linked to attention. They're kind of selecting information, either selecting from your uh, words, which want to be active, or selecting from your visual field, which want to be active. So there's a strong link between working memory and attention, and they're both kind of relying on these parietal lobes. Then another idea is that in order to kind of keep something refreshed over time, you need, in effect, a kind of a loop that refreshes that. And the idea is that your frontal lobes do that. So your frontal lobes are involved in holding in mind your goals and so on. So I can hold a sentence in mind for as long as I kind of want until I kind of get bored by just kind of repeating it or kind of concentrating on that. Uh, you, you know, until at some point you need to go away and do something else. But the idea is that your frontal lobes are involved in the refreshing mechanism and the parietal lobes are kind of holding in mind uh, certain sets of uh, things. And this is Badley's kind of model of this. So what he's got there is that these are different working memory systems. He's got one for uh, spatial, one for words. Here he's got one for temporarily accessing memories. So these are his short-term stores, if you will, and these are his long-term uh, stores there. And then he has what he calls a central executive or a frontal kind of system that is involved in kind of selecting whether or not we're holding in mind visual stuff or verbal stuff and to keep it kind of refreshed, to keep it kind of active. This uh, kind of model is seen as being a little bit old-fashioned now. Uh, and the reason being is that people kind of argue that actually you can cut out the middleman. You can get rid of all of these things here. And you can effectively just argue that all short-term memories or working memories is just the temporary activation of long-term memory, the temporary activation of language. You haven't got to copy language from one brain region to another. For instance, you just activate it where it lies. Okay? The reason why people have kind of moved away from this is that there's a lot of brain imaging evidence that's kind of uh, consistent with that. And this would be this sort of model here. So the idea is that you've still got something involved in selecting and maintaining information, which might be your frontal lobes or maybe your frontal lobes and your parietal lobes together. And then you've got kind of objects in your visual field or words that you're trying to, to remember, a list of words. And then you've got the, the things that make up those objects, your colours, your shapes, your phonemes, uh, whatever it is uh, for saying that. So here there is no working memory system. All working memory is, is that you are just activating from the top down things that are involved in vision and things that are involved in language, uh, in effect. Now the question with this is that where does the limited capacity come from? Why is it that you can only hold in mind certain things if all we're doing is activating long-term memory? Uh, and the claim made by other people is that, in effect, that this comes from kind of interference between these items. So there's, when you've got lots of words activated at the same time, they will start to interfere with each other. So they'll st start to compete and suppress each other. And this means that there is only a limited pool that can be activated. So those are the two different ways of thinking uh, about uh, long-term memory, uh, short-term memory, So One is the idea that you've got separate stores that you copy information into, and the other is that you've simply got the temporary activation um, of it without copying any information to any other part of the brain. Let's have a look at the evidence for these particular stores and how they might work. So our short-term memory is kind of classically assessed by digit span here. So with digit span, I would just say a list of uh, numbers like 5, 8, 3, 4, and then you say how many you can remember. Typically, most people can remember 7 plus or minus 2. So that is, most people have a digit span between 5 and 9. The original suggestion here from, from the 1950s is that actually these are, aren't just digits, these are meaningful chunks. So if instead of giving you um, single digits, I give you meaningful digits, um, such as famous years, so the year 2000, the year 1945, or whatever, the end of the Second World War, that kind of means something to you, the idea is that you can have, in that case, seven meaningful uh, chunks there, even though each one of those chunks is itself made up of four digits. Uh, so, so 
That was one of the initial uh, uh, kind of claims made. In effect, it's a little bit more complex than that. It, it, it almost certainly isn't necessarily uh, like that. So others have claimed actually no, that that isn't the case, that in effect you're using your long-term memory of years in order to do that. <coughs> And the evidence for this is that actually this 7 plus or minus 2 is not rigid. It goes up or down depending on what it is that you're doing and whether or not you're allowed to rehearse it. So if you're not allowed to rehearse uh, this, it goes down to about what people call 4 plus or minus 0. So everybody can remember about 4 uh, kind of words in short-term memory is the claim, unless you can uh, use this kind of loop. Also, if you're asked to remember polysyllabic words like skeleton, binoculars, and so on, it goes down from seven to some other number. So it suggests that actually, it, it, you know, that it, is, uh, it isn't just meaningful chunks. It is to do with the actual amount of stuff uh, uh, kind of in there. And also, um, the, this seven plus or minus two goes down if you've got words that are very confusable. So if I give you a list of words like map, cat, cap, and so on, you find it hard to repeat them back. And this is also consistent with the notion that actually all these phonemes are kind of competing and interfering with each other, and they are, you can't in effect discriminate one thing from another at that point. <coughs> and this is um, some evidence of this. So this is the classic kind of repeat after me, how many uh, can you get right? So people are worse at getting long words than short words, so it suggests it's not just meaningful chunks, there's something in it. And here this is if you can't rehearse it. So here is, whilst you're listening to that person, if you're just saying under your breath, one, two, three, four, five, six, and, and so on, that disrupts your ability uh, to, to remember. Okay? Uh, and in, in effect, what you tend to get is a, a, a span of closer to four rather than seven in these kinds of scenarios. And the same, uh, interestingly, seems to be true in the visual world, that is that this number four also seems to, to come up here. And these are different ways of testing for visual short-term memory. So here you're presented briefly, so maybe half a second or less, uh, four different things. Then you get a blank screen, and then you get something like this, and you have to say whether it's the same or different. And basically, people can do this accurately up to about four objects, and then beyond that, their performance kind of drops away. The performance doesn't go from 100 to zero in one note, it just deteriorates. And similarly here, what you're doing is that you're shown three objects, and then you're shown them here, and you have to recall, say, what the colour of that object was there from the colour wheel. And again, you can do this accurately up to about four objects, and beyond that, you start to get confused about what was there. What this also seems to show is that, again, it's, it's, um, there's evidence that it's partly to do with the number of objects and uh, the number of features. So what you can also have are kind of lines of different orientations and different colours. So here, if you've got four lines of four different orientations and four different colours, you've kind of almost got 16 pieces of information uh, to imagine, uh, to, to kind of put together here. But actually, your capacity isn't 16 because each of those is four different points in space. And it is to do with objects rather than the actual uh, number of features uh, in those objects. Uh, and this is the kind of evidence that people have done to argue that actually uh, holding things in mind in short-term memory is like activating perception or like activating uh, longer-term memory. And here, this is a brain imaging study where basically what you have to do in, um, in this case is that you've learned to associate a face with a house. So what happens is that you see a face and then you're asked to think about a house. <coughs> and what you find here is that you look at two different brain regions. This brain region is involved in seeing faces and this is involved in seeing houses. And you can see here that the brain activity flips from the, the, the face region to the house region. But what you also find is that the house region becomes active before you physically see the stimulus. So as you're remembering it, you start to activate uh, the, the kind of the, the house region that, or, or the, the set of 
voxels in fMRI that are associated with that house. And, and you would have the opposite one here if you associate this house with that face, you get the other kind of flip flop. So it suggests here that basically you are kind of activating your visual representations just by thinking about them and without seeing them. And that, that is itself kind of working memory. You're holding something in mind that is not perceptually present. It's either faded away or you're waiting for it to appear uh, in this case. And this is just the same thing with different faces and different houses. So that's short-term memory. The idea here is that th these have limited capacity uh, of kind of four to seven, depending on whether or not you're allowed to rehearse them, uh, and that you have separate systems, at least between for vision and or for perception and for, uh, for language. What about long-term memory uh, itself? So if we kind of look at different kinds of long-term memory, this is, in effect, a, a kind of perceptual memory or perceptual priming. And the idea here is that if I show you an object like this, and then at time two I show you this and say, what is that? You will be able to get it based on having just seen that. Whereas without that information, you will be bad at doing it. So you can look how much information you need in order to recognise this object. And the idea is if you've seen this before, that you need less information in order to, uh, to recognise it. So you will get it here, whereas if you've never seen that, you might get it there as to, to what it is. And this is what's called priming. And this is seen as being kind of implicit knowledge. And it's implicit because you're not asked, have you seen this object before? You're just asked, what is this? Okay, uh, you're, you're in effect asked an object recognition question rather than a memory question, but your previous experience is helping you to see in effect there, and that's why it's regarded uh, as memory. And similarly with words, you can do, do the same thing. So you can show people a list of words like house, and then at time two you can present them with the letters HO, and you just say, uh, think of the first word that comes to mind. And people will be more likely to say house than any other thing. In fact, it's hard to think of any other word beginning with HO when you've been primed uh, to do that. So home, hotel, uh, or whatever it might be. Okay. <clears throat> what you find is that patients with amnesia can also do this uh, as well. So they can um, benefit from seeing this before and, and getting those. And similarly from these here. And, so, and you can, they even do it even if you just change the task. So here, if you ask them, just say the first word that comes to mind, they are more likely to say the word house. If you say, what word did I give you before, beginning with the letters H-O, they will say, I don't know. Okay? So you have to, it depends on the way that you ask them. If you just say, think of something that comes to mind, they will get that word as much as anyone else. Whereas if you say, what word did I give you before, they become confused and other people get it. So here you've got the same system being interrogated in two ways. One in, uh, in a kind of more free or perceptual way and one in a memory retrieval way. In effect. So let's delve into uh, amnesia and have a look at what uh, parts of the brain kind of give rise to it. So obviously um, amnesia is traditionally associated with damage to the hippocampus. But a lot of patients don't just have damage to the hippocampus, they would have damage to the surrounding regions, which people refer to as the medial temporal lobe. And in fact, this was true of patient HM, he had damage to, um, to these wider regions. And each of these regions uh, is probably involved in long-term memory, but perhaps in somewhat different ways. Again, perhaps not a sharp cut-off between completely different uh, systems in each of these uh, blobs, but nevertheless some degree specialization. Remember you have your hippocampus on both the left side and the right side. Uh, in HM you would have had both hippocampi uh, removed. When you become uh, amnesic, so imagine you kind of have your brain injury here. What happens is that you kind of uh, become amnesic for things that happened before that. So you kind of lose information from say the last few years in life but you might remember things from your childhood or things from going back to school. And that's what's shown by the fading on this arrow here. 
is um, that, uh, that, that you lose your memory, but you don't lose them all. And this is obviously classically what you see if you know uh, anybody with dementia, which I suspect everybody does, that they will remember the old times, but not the new times, uh, in effect. And we'll talk about why that uh, happens. What also happens is that after your injury, you struggle to learn anything new. Uh, so new, new people you've met or new things that have happened to you uh, are very hard. And this is classically what we see in HM. Um, how can Carl Barron was able to like, learn new skills? Yes, that's right. So the idea, that, so learning new skills would be the, the idea that it's the procedural memory. So it would, be a, it would not be relying on the hippocampus, yeah. So it would be new memories of his life, I suppose. But, but it is a good point, and we'll, we'll come on to that uh, in a bit, yeah. So what memory systems uh, are impaired in amnesia? And I'll, I'll go through the evidence. So the, basically, the evidence seems to be that short-term memory and these kind of non-declarative, like procedural memories, are largely spared. Episodic memory is definitely impaired, and semantic memory, so knowledge of objects and words and people, is, well, it depends how you define them, and we'll talk about that, but there is some impairment there uh, in amnesia. But certainly, amnesics have a normal digit span, so their, um, their digit span is 7 plus or minus 2, in effect. And as I mentioned before, HM could remember a number of 15 minutes by continuously repeating it, but forgot it within one minute of stopping and had no memory of ever being asked to do it. This is HM's uh, skill learning, where here what you're having to do is you're having to draw around a star, but you're looking at your hand in a mirror. So what that means is that in order to make a leftward movement of the pen, you move it to your visual right. Okay, so it's as if your uh, your visual feedback is uh, a, you know a reflection of where your hand truly is. Uh, and in effect, what you have is that on the first day, uh, each one of these is a different learning attempt, and what you're counting is the number of times that you go outside of these lines here. Uh, that that's in effect what this is there. So you can see that HM was able to learn this. And then he goes away and sleeps on it. But then the next day, his performance doesn't go up to be rubbish. It actually stays at a similar level to what it ended on the first day. And actually, by the third day, he's cracked it. He can do the skill. But what happened is at the start of each day, it's like, oh, do you remember that time when you learned to draw uh, in a mirror? And he said, no. So he had no memory of ever doing this task. But clearly, he was able to do the task. By day three, he, he was you know, a pro uh, at doing this. He made maybe one error uh, you know, at a time in drawing uh, backwards, uh, in, in effect, with this. And they can show evidence of uh, priming. So um, I show you how, then I show you HM and say, just say the first thing that comes to mind. They can do that. Okay? But if you say, what did I show you before, they cannot. This is more kind of what you would call statistical uh, learning or probability learning, where basically what you're, you're given is that you're given a pack of cards and you have to effectively learn whether the weather is going to rain or shine. The thing about these rules is that they're hard to put into words. So it might be that 80% of the time this predicts sunshine, 20% predicts this, 10% it's uh, random or whatever. So uh, th th these are kind of complex patterns and the rules behind them are also quite complex. So it's not uh, something that you can put into words, but people um, can learn it, and people with amnesia are capable, capable of learning it as well. This kind of statistical learning seems to depend on um, uh, another set of regions within the brain around the basal ganglia, which is impaired in Parkinson's disease. So patients with Parkinson's disease are impaired at learning these rules. So we imagine that Parkinson's disease is all about the motor system, and it is about the motor system, but it's actually about other things to do with habits uh, and kind of learning. I won't go into that, but all I'm saying is it provides evidence that there are multiple learning systems, one that's affected by Parkinson's, and in this case, amnesics are, are good at it. In this test, what they do is, so this is kind of an implicit measure, if you will, because all there has to do is say, is it going to rain or shine? In this test, they're shown one of these cards and say, have you seen this card before or not? So at that point, they're asked to think about specific kind of episodes or they're asked to kind of reflect on 
uh, other kinds of memory. And here, people with amnesia cannot d tell you whether they've seen that car before, but the patients with Parkinson's can. So again, this is kind of a classic double dissociation, that uh, people with amnesia can learn the skill, but have no memory of the particular items, whereas uh, patients with Parkinson's disease cannot learn the skill, but can remember the particular items. Okay. What about um, semantic memory? So one classic way of thinking about semantic memory is just, you know, are these patients able to produce kind of fluent language and so on? So we've seen in the previous lecture that when your semantic memory goes, your speech becomes, um, you say things like, I'm going to the what you call it, and I met her, and I'm going, you know, so it becomes very impoverished in terms of your vocabulary. But you can see in these amnesic patients that that isn't the case. They can remember, for instance, their... Knowing who your wife is is part of your semantic memory. It's also part of your visual knowledge uh, as well. Uh, you know, knowing who your children are and so on. So it seems to be that semantic memory is quite good. But here, maybe this isn't a fair test. And the reason it's not a fair test is think about when you learn most of your words in life and when you kind of learn a, a, a lot of other things. And you learn them all kind of, you know, in early childhood, basically, in some extent, early teens. But we know that uh, amnesics are good at remembering their childhood and their early teens. So the question is, what about vocabulary that has entered into existence in the last year? So uh, it's always hard to think of vocabulary that's entered it, but anything, for instance, to do with the internet or technology, these sorts of things, places that, that have come up, knowing who Donald Trump is, for instance, would an amnesic patient know that? Uh, and that, or knowing who the, the president is, for instance, that is a classic example of semantic memory. <clears throat> and the evidence here suggests that actually, in a lot of cases, when you have more um, recent evidence uh, of, of this, that, that amnesics are impaired, so they will not know who um, Boris Johnson or any of these people are. Uh, words that have entered into the vocabulary in the last 10 years, go on, so we think of what, um, they will not uh, know what these are, uh, for instance, they won't know how to define them, they will not use them in their daily life. Yeah. If one of the words was like, if, if in some way it like scared them or something like that, mm -hmm. then would they get a skin condition? Yes, they would, yes. So if a word scared them, so if, if Donald Trump scared them or something like this, they would get a skin contactor's response to him, yeah. But they wouldn't know who he was. They wouldn't be able to articulate, you know, any kind of story about him or whatever. What, what is Rebo's law? Re, yeah, I will, sorry, I'll go through. Rebo's law is basically the, um, this thing here, the idea that you've also got a, a kind of a curve well, it's also called a temporal gradient. That you remember things that happened to you recently. Uh, you remember, no, the opposite. You remember things that happened to you a long time ago, but not things that happened to recently. So uh, you remember your childhood, but you don't remember what happened since, typically as you become amnesic. This is, but, but it is quite variable. And the evidence here is actually that, that there are some amnesic patients who are quite capable uh, of learning semantic knowledge. And the question is, how do they do that? Uh, and this is an example of somebody who had hippocampal damage as a child, but, but clearly has a very good kind of semantic knowledge of the world. Only Basically, what's, um, what's kind of unusual uh, about him is that because he had his... Um, uh, he, his hippocampus was damaged at birth, but he has been able to acquire uh, semantic memories uh, with this. Uh, and in fact, you know, he, he was able to, to speak and, and things like that. So what's been shown about patients like him is that, um, that actually that, that there is a region outside of the hippocampus called the... I have to go back, sorry about this called the entorhinal cortex, where was the entorhinal cortex, that, that is largely spared in, in some of these patients who can do that. So if you damage both of your hippocampus and your entorhinal cortex, then this strongly affects your, um, both your episodic and your semantic memory. 
Whereas in John, he's damaged his hippocampus, but his entorhinal cortex is spared. And this might be important for learning uh, other kinds of knowledge, like language uh, and, and so on. And that might be why it wasn't picked up sooner, that it was only, for instance, when he went to a holiday camp and getting lost, uh, that's the case. And in the second part of the lecture, I'll talk about the idea that the hippocampus is storing specifically spatial information. And that might be why, for instance, uh, his uh, kind of symptom was around getting lost, for instance, and not being able to, uh, to learn speak, which he could do uh, quite well. Um, OK, so we'll break here for uh, 10 minutes, and then I'll go on to talk about exactly what it is that the, uh, the hippocampus and these other structures and the medial temporal lobe are doing. So, so far, I've kind of argued that, uh, that amnesia is clearly a problem in some aspects of long-term memory, particularly in episodic memory, but also to some extent in uh, semantic memory, but that might depend on when the semantic memories were acquired, whether they were recently or in uh, a long time ago. But also it might depend on where, whether the, um, the brain damage is very extensive around the hippocampus or not. And that might affect the degree to which semantic memory is also there alongside that. This kind of still leaves us with the issue is that what exactly is then, uh, the hippocampus in these regions doing? Could we draw a kind of a module around them and label them as episodic memory? Clearly the word memory itself is not capturing it. Uh, is this a, a kind of a module for episodic memory? And again, um, there, there, there are kind of various issues around that. So if we want to call the hippocampus kind of a module for episodic memory, then why is it that patients who are amnesic or with dementia can remember things that happened to them in their childhood? Why is that uh, preserved, for instance? So we'll, we'll talk a little bit, bit about that. But these are three different uh, theories about what exactly uh, is, is going on here. One uh, theory is what, what I uh, call the kind of standard consolidation theory of people like uh, Larry Squire, who argues that the hippocampus is important for, in his case, both semantic and episodic memory, but only for a limited amount of time. And after that, these memories, in effect, get uh, transferred to other parts of the brain, into the cortex. The multiple trace theory argues that basically that you always need uh, your hippocampus for, for this, and that this is storing contextual memories, uh, in effect. Um, so in this case, if, if your hippocampus is always needed for, for all kinds of memories, why is it that uh, amnesic people can remember things from uh, years ago? And uh, the claim here is that these are not like episodic memories, that they are like stories, okay, uh, that you're telling to, uh, and that that is why they're there, is that they are not contextualized. These are kind of more uh, schematic uh, kind of things, that they're not like true memories. That would be the explanation. The third theory um, are, is similar to the multiple trace theory in that it assumes that you always need your hippocampus for remembering. But here it argues that instead of its um, hippocampus storing contextualized <coughs> memories, they argue that it's specifically involved in storing spatial memories, so memories for where you are. And of course, when you think of episodic memories about going on holidays and so on, they nearly are always well. Perhaps by definition, they're always grounded in being in a particular place, uh, and, and so on. And that, that's this theory. So we'll try and tease these uh, theories uh, apart, and I'll, I'll kind of unpack them uh, again. So let's have a look at the first one. So basically, the first theory argues that amnesia is, in effect, a deficit in consolidation. Consolidation is the process by which moment-to-moment -moment changes in brain activity are translated into permanent structural changes. So, so, in effect, what it's doing here is that when two neurons fire together, it changes their, um, their responsiveness to each other, but eventually it will change them structurally, that they will go on to form permanent uh, connections. And that, in, in effect, is uh, consolidation. So, basically, the, here, consolidation can explain why people with amnesia don't learn new things. So, that's kind of what's called anterograde memory is simply because they cannot, uh, they can do things kind of in the moment, but they cannot translate those momentary changes into long-lasting uh, change, at least within the domain of uh, these particular forms of memories. 
So that explains why amnesic cannot learn new things. But why, why does it, how does it explain retrograde loss? So when you become amnesic, you lose memory of the, uh, the things that happened before the event. Well, the, the claim made here is that basically that the hippocampus it has a time-limited role. And memories, so if I become uh, amnesic now, the memories for things that happened a year ago haven't fully consolidated. So therefore, they get wiped. Whereas the memories for things that I did 10 years ago or 20 years ago have been fully consolidated. And when I get rid of my hippocampus, they are okay. okay? And that's the, the, the kind of claim uh, made here. And in, in effect, this is the, the, the best way of kind of explaining that. So the idea is that the, the hippocampus kind of contains, um, in effect, uh, each one of these would be like a neuron that, in, in, in effect, acts like an index or a pointer to various other things. What are these other things? Well, for instance, if we think about the, the memory for this lecture, it would be about being in this room. It would be about who was here. Uh, it would be about your, your mood at the time. Uh, what was happening outside, it wouldn't be about the words that were spoken. And each of these things might be represented in different parts of the brain, so your language part of the brain, your visual part of the brain, uh, or whatever. And the idea is that this um, is what is forming now in your, your brain for this event, is that your hippocampus is in effect joining the dots. It's joining the spatial location with my words, with this, and so on. And that that is what it is to have an episodic memory, is to join all these things together. But what happens over time is that the hippocampus itself becomes less important. It kind of fades. And what happens here is that these different units, so my words, this room and so on, effectively become bound together and that that then becomes the memory trace itself independently of the hippocampus. So in effect, the memory trace is initially the hippocampus joining all these things together and then all these things become joined together independently of the hippocampus. Now, if you damage your hippocampus, you can never join any new events together, and your life uh, is, uh, does not form any new episodes. Uh, but what would also happen is that if you damage your hippocampus here, for instance, this memory um, might be partially there, but if you damage your hippocampus here, that, it doesn't matter. That memory is already in the rest of your brain, so you will be able to remember that. You'll be partially be able to remember that, and this one is going nowhere. Okay, you will have no memory of it. So this is the the explanation of temporal gradients uh, according to uh, to that. By temporal gradients, the idea that you can remember things from early in life, but not uh, more recently, uh, as you see in Alzheimer's. So how does this kind of uh, stack up, and why would people uh, disagree with this? Well, this is uh, an example of some just showing you what this kind of looks like in a, a single case. So this was uh, a, a famous professor who wrote their autobiography in the 1980s and then became amnesic. Now, the thing about this is they'd written down all the interesting things about their life in a book, so you could effectively use the book to test them. Do you remember that? So, the, again, it's a, an unusual uh, case that you can do that. So this person became amnesic in the 1980s, and you can see that basically they'd lost the 1970s. Uh, they had some knowledge of the 60s, and then going back to, this is presumably their childhood here, they had uh, a reasonably uh, good memory uh, of this. Other people have argued, well, th this might not be th the case here, because it looks like it takes kind of decades to consolidate. And, and uh, people said, well, that would be a very puzzling thing for the, for the brain to do. Why would it take that long? Uh, and particularly when you look at uh, evidence in mice and so on, the, the evidence there is that they can consolidate much faster. So it's puzzling that the human hippocampus shows that this uh, kind of effect. You know, why is it that it takes uh, quite so long to, to kind of burn these things in? So those are the kinds of criticisms that people have had here. Not so much of the data, but it's like, oh, but, but why? Why is that? And there is other evidence that supports um, uh, Squire's view that basically the hippocampus has a time-limited role. And, and that's basically if you contrast patients who have semantic dementia with, with Alzheimer's. So if we look here at patients with Alzheimer's dementia, this is getting them to recall events in their life at three different time points. So things that have happened to them in the last few years, 
things that happen from an early adulthood and things that happen from childhood. And this is the classic kind of pattern. Sorry, the, it's kind of reversed because here, well, is it? No, it's the same. It is the same. It's the same. So they're bad at remembering things that happened in the last few years and better at childhood. They're still worse than controls, by the way, who are up there. Here, these are patients with semantic dementia um, who do not have damage to the hippocampus but have these problems in, uh, in words and kind of other knowledge. Um, these patients, in effect, have good knowledge of things that happened to them uh, recently. And the idea here is that they have an intact hippocampus, so they can, in effect, uh, use that uh, as kind of a temporary store. But as things leave the hippocampus and go into the cortex, their cortex is breaking down, that kind of knowledge is breaking down, and they are then struggling to remember. Um, so in effect, you, patients with semantic dementia have kind of damage at this level, at the top level here, and patients with amnesia have damage at that level level there, and it ends up in producing kind of complementary uh, profiles. So patients with semantic dementia, when they lose that, the memory's gone. But here, they've still got the, uh, the hippocampus kind of help to bind things together, at least in the short term. So this is evidence for, uh, for that um, theory. So this is the theory I've presented so far, is that basically the hippocampus stores things temporarily. And the process of consolidation involves moving things from the hippocampus uh, to the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the cortex. Why have other people suggested alternative things? Well, I'll show you the evidence that, that, that is somewhat problematic. But what, what, these other traces, what these other theories effectively argue is that, in, in fact, you always need your hippocampus uh, for episodic memories. Uh, or, or what they would kind of call contextualized memories. And the reason you could retrieve older memories is because they are not episodic. They are more like stories than they are like real episodes that you're reliving. And that's the, the, the central claim, certainly, of this one here. <coughs> so basically, they argue that the hippocampus stores contextualized memories, which are rather like episodic memories, not a million miles away from the, uh, the other theories. But the crucial thing about this is that it's always needed to, to have that binding. So they say that when you acquire new uh, semantic information, like learning a new city, that this is kind of like episodic memory. And it's only over time, when you generalize across multiple episodes, that it becomes uh, like that. So episodic memories are like well told, uh, become like well told stories, and they are not dependent on the hippocampus. So again, you've got this shift in whether uh, on dependence on the hippocampus in both of these cases. But in one case, things are being transferred over. And in the other case, things are being transformed. They're being transformed from being very specific and context-like to being more schematic and story-like, uh, in effect. Okay? So it's a rather subtle difference, but that is, you know, that's where the, the, the kind of the research is at uh, at the moment. Why would somebody kind of take this theory over and above the other? Well, the, the standard consolidation theory assumes that if you do fMRI of, say, remembering a holiday from two years ago versus remembering a holiday from, say, 10 or 15 years ago, that in effect your hippocampus should be more important for your recent memory than your remote memory. Whereas, in fact, the evidence is that, that it's important for them both. The fMRI shows that it lights up when you're recalling both recent uh, and remote, at least when they're matched for, for things like the level of detail. Okay? If you're not matching for the level of detail, then they might be more like stories, and that's where uh, the, the, the problem lies. But the other kind of evidence that, that people have uh, had against the standard consolidation theory is that basically if you're asked to just create imaginations of scenes, so imagine something that's never happened, uh, to you, that you imagine uh, getting married on a beach with your best friend and, uh, and this sort of thing. You can create these kinds of scenarios. But if you do that uh, in an fMRI thing, you are activating your hippocampus. And these are not real memories. These are imagined things. And the idea here is that this is, then it's not about memory. It's more about linking these different elements together, both in imagination, but, but not just in terms of kind of consolidating things that have happened. And basically,
obviously there is also evidence of the nature of the memory changes. So if, if you have kind of fear uh, associations that depend on the hippocampus, that when these memories kind of lose their context, they become less dependent on the hippocampus. So it suggests that the hippocampus is needed when you need a specific context. And when you don't need specific context, other systems can take over. Okay. The cognitive map theory is very uh, similar to this. And they basically argue that the hippocampus is there for the, the spatial aspects uh, of memory. So if you think about, you know, your fictitious wedding on the beach and so on, it's creating the scene of the beach is what, what it is uh, needed for. So both in imagination and in terms of perception and in terms of memory, it is all about space uh, and, and navigation here. Um, so space is just a particular kind of context, which is why these two things are, are, are similar theories. It's just, a, you know, uh, so this one would include things other than space, whereas this one is specifically around where you are located. So the evidence for this comes from the, the long-standing findings that the hippocampus seems to store spatial maps uh, of the environment. Uh, and these spatial maps are kind of independent of your viewpoint. Um, so, so it's about where you are rather than your orientation in the room, for instance, whether you're facing this way or that way. It's about being in a particular location. Uh, and it comes from evidence of what are called place cells. And I'll show you a video here. So this has got sound. So this rat is running around the room, and it's got an electrode that is just recording from a neuron in the brain. And when it goes in certain locations, the neuron fires. So you can see it's got, sometimes it fires in random locations, but it has a preferred corner of the box that, that it goes to here. So that's just a heat map showing statistically where that, uh, that region is being represented. And the idea is that obviously there would be some neurons that respond to that part of space, some to this part of space, uh, and so on. And that each one of these is giving you information about where you are. Uh, but this is also important to remember where you were when things happened as well, or at least that is the claim. Okay. So these are, again, just different uh, examples of place cells uh, that, that you can see here that sometimes they're in different parts of the room. And the idea is that collectively all of these different place cells figure out uh, you know, where something is, where something happened, uh, and, and so on. Other evidence that the hippocampus kind of stores a, a kind of more spatial map it comes from, uh, again, uh, lesions of animals where they're asked to kind of navigate and find their way around. So here this is the, what's called the classic Morris water maze where what you've got here is that you've got rats who have to swim to find a platform. Rats are good swimmers. Uh, they can't see the platform. You've got murky water here. Uh, and what you find here is that when you lesion their hippocampus, they find the platform through trial and error. They just swim around randomly. Okay? Whereas, um, whereas other animals, once they've learnt where it is, they will just go directly, uh, swim directly to it. Okay? Um, so again, this is the, the kind of evidence suggests that there is something like a spatial map of the hippocampus. Place cells have been found in um, the human hippocampus, but, but again, they also respond to imagining being in a location as well as physically being in a location. Um, what does differ between um, humans and kind of rodents, so, though, is that in fMRI, it seems that the right hippocampus is more... Uh, sensitive to, uh, to spatial information, whereas the left hippocampus is more sensitive to other kinds of information. So again, this isn't strictly consistent with the, um, the idea of the hippocampus just being a spatial map. It suggests that it's storing a spatial map and other kinds of context information. So for instance, one of these uh, studies here mentioned at the bottom 
kind of uses a virtual reality thing where you're having to navigate around a town. So you remember your route around the town, but then you remember certain events. So an event might be remembering meeting a character, remembering that that character gave you a cup or something weird like this. And this is just an MRI, so these aren't amnesic uh, patients. But then you have a look which parts of the hippocampus are involved in remembering different elements. So remembering your route versus remembering who you met and who gave you which object. And you could show here that there are differences between the left hippocampus, which is about who gave you what in which order, and the right hippocampus, which is around uh, your route. But this seems to be more specific to, to humans, these differences between left 